It is now our pleasure to introduce Trevor Noah, host of Comedy Central's The Daily Show. Before winning worldwide acclaim as the new host of this Emmy and Peabody award-winning satirical news program, Mr. Noah had already won worldwide acclaim with The Racist, his 2012 Indenburg Fringe Festival one-man show. The son of a white Swiss father and a black South African mother who had to pretend to be his father's servant during all too brief moments of family interaction, he experienced a deeply unconventional childhood toward the end of the tumultuous apartheid era. Born a Crime is a tender, scary, often funny, coming-of-age memoir of a country at the crossroads, as well as a love letter to Noah's remarkable mother. Tonight, Mr. Noah will be joined in conversation by Tamela Edwards, co-anchor at 6ABC News. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Trevor Noah and Tamela Edwards to the Free Library of Philadelphia. All right, as always, I've talked you up. <laughs> so this is the best crowd that he's going to get. Welcome to Trevor Noah. Thank it's you so much for having me, and thank you for coming out, everybody. Thank you so much. And as you know, Trevor has a book out called Born a Crime. Uh, it's a memoir, but it's, I just told him backstage, it feels like if we went out to a bar and he started telling me his craziest stories. <laughs> they were, they're in this book, and I will tell you, I laughed out loud. People in the office were turning around wondering what was going on at my thank cubicle. Thank you very much, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Uh, let's talk about Born a Crime. You say at one point, humans are humans and sex is sex. Nine months after people showed up, mixed race people began to appear, yet you, occupied an unusual space. No, he writes that he occupied an unusual space. You would think there were a million Trevor, Trevor Noahs, given that basic humans are humans and sex is sex. Yeah, but unfortunately, uh, humans are humans, so uh, humans will hate, you know, and they found a way to uh, condemn what was happening because the whole point of oppressing people in South Africa was to keep the minority governing over the majority. And the way you do that is to make sure that they don't spiral out of control. One of the ways they would spiral out of control is if you let them uh, procreate in a way that mixes their blood with, uh, with white people. You know? And th the rule is different to the United States where you had the one drop rule, which uh, worked for the United States because it made it simple. You go, if you are mixed with any black person, then you are black. You couldn't risk that in South Africa because that would mean you are emboldening the majority. You're increasing their numbers and now you're increasing their numbers with people who could pass as white sometimes, you know, which is just gonna defy your system. So, um, so they, they made that a rule and then they separated the people out. So as much as people are people, uh, unfortunately the law is still the law. When I first saw you, I thought, okay, he's gonna say that he's colored, but you explain in the book, it's a very separate thing than how you considered yourself and what you went through. Yeah, so in South Africa, Colored, and that was a thing I had to learn when I came to the US. I mean, I remember when I first came here, every time I'll say colored, people would look at me like I just escaped a, like a slave novel or something, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, um, and I always had to explain to people that where I'm from, this skin tone is known as colored. In South Africa, they essentially created a race that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And it's not just a race, it's a culture. The people speak with a different accent, uh, they speak, they have a different dialect and a language, and it's a completely different world, an area that is only populated by people who look exactly like me. And, and that is generations of, and generations of people where they can almost not trace themselves back to a black or white person, you know, because every time that this crime was committed, they would take the, the, the child of that crime and then that child would be sent off to an orphanage and they slowly grew these communities of colored people. Um, but in my world, because I was never taken away from my parents, because I was never forced to live in a community that I didn't belong to, I grew up as black. You know, I, I, I only know the black experience. I only know how to be an African. So as much as people wanted to call me colored, because colored is a culture in South Africa, I, was, I realized at a very young age, and I write about that in the book, that I was indeed black. It's up to you if you want to tell the story or read it, but you tell just how insane this was to try to go to the park with your parents or with your mother that at times, I think it ends with, <laughs> and she would drop me and run away as if I was a bag of weed. <laughs> what is that, like 50 something? Where is that? <laughs> I wonder where that is. If I, knew the, if I knew the page, I would read that. 
Or you can tell you. it, it's up to you. I can tell it to you, I probably know the words, because I've told it to my friends so many times, so many times, but um, basically growing up in South Africa during the time that I, I grew up in, uh, one of the biggest rules was that black and white people weren't allowed to freely associate. And this meant in all shapes and forms, you know, all the way through, you know, from just casual interactions to sexual interactions. And my parents obviously br uh, broke these rules, but there was a price to pay. And one of those prices was that we couldn't be a normal family. But my mom insisted that we try. So, you know, we would go out together and one of the days in particular, I remember, was uh, we went out to Jubei Park. It was basically the central park of Johannesburg. You know, it's you know, big, giant trees and a little, little lake in the middle of it, and there's chessboard pieces, you know, the human-sized chessboard pieces that you can move around. And, um, and we went there together. And my dad w was walking ahead of us so as not to seem like he was part of the family. And my mom was walking with me, and she would act like she was looking after the child that was colored and she was the maid. And I saw my dad, and so I started running after him, you know? And I was like, daddy, 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 and I chased him, and he couldn't have me come to him, so he ran away. <laughs> and, and so I thought, well, the game is on. Uh, <laughs> and so I chased him, and so my mother chased me to stop me from chasing him, and in my head, I was a child having a wonderful day at the park with my parents. <laughs> And they were terrified because I was threatening our livelihoods. But, um, but that's, that's what we did, you know. And, and um, if we weren't with my dad, my mom realized very quickly how you could break the rules of a nonsensical regime. And uh, since it was all broken down by color, appearances are everything. Because that's really what color and race is. It's just an appearance. So what my mom would do sometimes is if the police were cracking down in the city is she would uh, get a friend of hers who lived uh, in our building, a woman named Queen. And Queen was a colored woman. And so Queen looked very similar to me. And what my mom would do is we would go out with Queen into the streets and my mom would walk behind us dressed as a maid. And it, she would make it appear as if she works for this colored family. And I would walk and hold hands with Queen and I would look like I'm Queen's child. And I have pictures of me as a child uh, where I'm walking with Queen in the streets and it looks like she's my mom. And then there's this woman in the background who's photobombing all the pictures. <laughs> and that's my mom. Um, you know, and we tried and we used every single tool we could to navigate this system. And my mom, stubborn and defiant as she was, even if she, she couldn't have queen, if the, the police were still out and she wanted to take me out for a walk, she would. And she would just walk with me as a maid and act like uh, you know she was my caregiver, not my mom. And if the police showed up, then she would just drop my hand and act like I wasn't hers. And I always said I felt like a bag of weed. <laughs> Your mother is an interesting figure in the book. The book is very much a tribute to her. And she's an interesting woman in that she refuses to accept it. She's the architect in her head almost of the life you live now. And you tell a story of her walking you around in places and she would sometimes lift you up over a gate so that you could look in and tell her. Yes. And it was almost as if she wanted to see, but she wanted you to see there's something more. That was one of the greatest gifts my mother gave me. Um, I always tell people that's what I encourage every parent gives their child is knowledge. And not just knowledge that you, you, you get from books, not just information, but knowledge. Um, my mother imparted uh, on me the knowledge that there was more than what we had. There was more than what we were told we were allowed to have. And so my mom made it her mission to take me into places and spaces that I didn't belong. Take me into places that I would never see. There was a chance I was never going to see this in the future. There was no end in sight for us. There was no idea that apartheid was gonna end. And what we'd do is, on random weekends, my mom would drive me, you know, we'd come back from church, we'd be driving back to, to where we lived, which was way on the outskirts, and we would drive through rich white neighborhoods, and my mom would stop the car, and then we'd just look at, you know, people's houses, and they, they had giant walls, and you could never see over them these estates, and so my mom would lift me onto her shoulders, like a little periscope, <laughs> and I would look over the wall, 
and I would just describe everything I could see. I'd be like, they have a swimming pool, and there's dogs, and there's a, there's a car, and there's a double-story house, and, and there's a, you know, and, and I would just tell her the story. I'd just describe this world that I saw. And what was powerful about that for me was the fact that there were many kids who grew up in my neighborhood who never knew of these things. They didn't know you could have a swimming pool in your house. They didn't even know what a swimming pool was. They didn't know of tennis courts. They didn't know that some people could have uh, a driveway in their house. I remember the, how that blew my mind the first time I saw it. Like, they've got a road inside their house. <laughs> it just blew my mind. And, and that's what my mom did. She took me into spaces that I didn't have access to. And I think the importance of that was, and I appreciate that today, is people often say to me, they go, did you, did you have a dream that you would be where you are today? And I say, no. I say, no, because my imagination didn't stretch this far, you know? And sometimes when people say, follow your dreams, I go, that, that's slightly limiting depending on where you're from, <laughs> because you can only dream of what you can imagine. And sometimes your imagination is limited by the confines of your world. So there are many kids in Africa growing up who don't dream of being an astronaut, and it's not because they're not aspirational, it's because they've never been shown that the man can go into space. They've never been shown that, that possibility. And I think just by showing me that world, my mom gave me the ability to imagine one day going into that world. Do you wanna do a party trick and have some fun? Let's go. <laughs> In the book, you talk about the importance of language and that yes. what stands out about you is you can sort of be a chameleon because you can speak everybody's language and they don't know what to do. I try. And I want everybody to understand how amazing this is. Do you want to say a word or a phrase in every language you know how to say? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've said a few in English, so we're good there. <laughs> uh, uh, in, it uh, saves your life a couple of times. Um, so in, in Afrikaans, it would be a... You know, if I say something to you, I'd say, Good uh, night, Jelle. This is a wonderful chance for all of us to meet. That means nice to meet all of you. Good evening. That's in Afrikaans, which is derivative of Dutch. Uh, in Zulu, I'd say, Sane bonani nonke, nyadja wolo ugun bona lap, which means I'm, yeah, good evening, everybody. Nice to see you here. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of which ones. Um, in Tswana, I could say, Libuto la kake Trevanoa. My name is Trevanoa. Um, you know, uh, in, in, uh, I'm trying to, there's so many phrases, so many words. My, my favorite phrase in my mom's language is um, in Xhosa, which is one of the languages of the cliques, um, which means um, I, will, I will beat you upside the head. <laughs> you, you idiots of a child. Um, uh, so yeah. So but it is an unusual and special talent that it's almost like a, a superpower that you have to fit into all these groups. How does it serve you now? How does that ability to meld, do you use it now to sort of figure out people's languages and cultures? I do, I do. I think we all do to a certain extent, but I, I definitely do that now, you know, traveling the world. And I continue to try and learn languages. You know, I can hold a basic conversation in German I'm trying to learn Spanish and Portuguese now as well, because I've come to realize it opens worlds up to you. It opens people up to you, more importantly. Um, you don't even realize the barriers that are in place until it affects you, uh, affects you on a larger level. For instance, we were talking about the election briefly backstage, and it was funny to me how so many people were shocked by how Hispanic voters <coughs> turned out in this election. And they were saying, oh, no one could have predicted that so many Hispanic people would vote for Donald Trump and no one. And I read fascinating articles from Hispanic journalists who said, no, we knew this. We knew this all along. Nobody listened to us. And then, you know, the pollster said, how did we get it wrong? It's like, because you didn't speak to them in a language they understood. Mm -hmm. And it's such a small and stupid thing that people take for granted, but everyone just assumed walking up to a Hispanic person in English and giving, you know, conducting a poll, they assumed that they were getting the correct information and they assumed that the person would be truthful with them when speaking a language that wasn't theirs. And yet you find your poll would have been completely different had you spoken to them in a language they understood. You take it to another level and you think of places like Michigan where they found people just 
hated elites. People didn't want to talk to Wisconsin. They showed that people stopped being polled because they got irritated hearing from these people at the university. You know, people were like, we hate these elites. We don't want to listen to any of you. And again, if someone had spoken to them in their language, even though it's still English, it's just a different language that separates you from the learned class to a class that hasn't had the opportunity to, to have an education, all of a sudden you communicate differently. And so I find I still use that today. You know, I, I meet people and I have connections with them that they wouldn't ordinarily have because I know how to speak their language. And even in English, there are different languages. And you said, in fact, being an immigrant gave you a different insight into what happened with Latinos, a third of whom voted for Trump. Tell, tell them what you told me backstage. Oh, well, I, I said it's, it's, it's not surprising. You know, when people go, how, how could they vote for Trump? And I go, as an immigrant, I understand this completely. It's, it's, it's pull the ladder up syndrome. That's, it's as simple as that. People take for granted how many Latino people liked Trump's message. It was a woman in Cleveland who woke me up to this. I was in Cleveland for the Republican convention and there was a woman in the streets and she was proudly chanting Trump's name as she marched around the convention center, around the arena. And I, I pulled her aside and I said, please do me a favor and help me understand. I said, are you, are you uh, Latino? And she said, yes, I'm from Mexico. And I said, and you're voting for Trump? And she said, I love Trump. And I said, why? And she said, because I want him to get rid of all of these illegal immigrants. And I said, okay, so you're legal. And she said, yes. And I said, but why do you want him to get rid of all of them? And she, and she said, because they give me a bad name. I'm not illegal, they must leave, and they're blocking the path for my family who are legally trying to come to this country. So get rid of all of them so that more people like me can come in. And I was fast, I'd, I'd never heard this before. I'd never, and I, immediately I realized, I was like, wow, there's a different conversation that's not being had just because people are not, not communicating with each other. But as an immigrant, as someone who's come into a world, as someone who's seen immigration problems in South Africa, we have the same issues. And maybe it's easier to see them sometimes because in South Africa, we don't have the racial aspect applied to it as well. You know, so we have immigrants coming in from Zimbabwe and they are black and black South Africans are reacting to them the exact same way that some Trump supporters are acting towards Mexicans. And here, because of the added layer of race, Sometimes you can't get to the underlying thing, and that is just a tribalism and a fear of somebody coming in to take what you've worked for. In the book, you talk about the situation you're in, that you end up spending a lot of time alone. You talk about hanging out by a mulberry tree. Everybody else is in a group, but nobody will hang out with Trevor, so he's like, fine, I'll pick my own mulberries. Yep. And you say, in fact, you almost don't know how to be lonely because you almost prefer it. You, you know how to do it. People would look at you and think, this guy has to, he's a comedian, he must love being in a crowd and being surrounded. How does that comfort with loneliness work in your life and what you do? I love, I love being alone. So when I, was, when I was growing up, my grandmother was extremely protective of me because were I to be spotted by the police in Soweto, a black area, I would be taken away, right? The police would confiscate me from my parents, send me off to an orphanage because they did not want any mixing any mixing of any blood which could throw off the status quo of their regime. So my grandmother guarded me you know, with life and limb. You know, she tells me stories of how I used to dig a hole under the gate to escape like a little dog. I would, <laughs> she would lock all the gates and she'd find this little hole and I'd be gone and she'd be chasing me down the street and at every corner someone would just be pointing <laughs> because they all knew her and they all knew me and I was the only person that she could be looking for. And I was the only person who looked like me in my neighborhood. So you just saw this little light-skinned child running in a sea of black people. And everyone was like, yep, it's that way. <laughs> but she was extremely protective, um, you know? And, and she was that way because she didn't want to lose me. Um, and I didn't know this at that age. I just thought she was protective because she was a grandmother and she didn't want a child going outside. So I stayed in, indoors and I would read and I would hang out and I'd be good at you know, being by myself and I'm still great at that. Uh, and what's wonderful about it is, um, I guess because of the escape of books, I always tell people, people go, it must have been horrible, you, you're in the house. I'm like, no, I was everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. you know, I spent summers in Narnia, I, you know, I <laughs> traveled to you know, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, I was in England, I, I've been everywhere. You know, and that's, I took solace in books. Um, and, the way that served me and the way that continues to serve me is 
when you're good at being by yourself, you sometimes just get to watch the flow of people around you. You get to sit in a corner and because you're not preoccupied with going with the flow or with the pack, you, you, you monitor what's happening, you, you see it, you know, you almost view life like a, like a nature documentary. You know, you just sit down the side like David Attenborough and you just watch <laughs> the watering hole and, and you get to comment on, on, on your mind. And I still use that till this day. So I, I, I still I enjoy company. I love hanging out with people, but you will never hear me say the phrase, I'm, I'm alone. I always just say, I'm, I'm by myself. So if I want to know who's the cheetah and who's the gazelle in the situation, <laughs> I just come sit next to you. Yeah, I'm always <laughs> sitting on the side, just commenting. The book has moments of great pain. There are times when your family's very poor, you're literally discussing eating goats, goat heads, worms, what's terrible. Goat heads were on the good day, by the way. Yeah, and the worms, though. <laughs> worms, you couldn't sell the worms. Yeah, no, the worms weren't good. Sleeping in cars, and then of course, the most painful chapter, what happens, the abuse from your stepfather, and what happens to your mother when she's shot. And yet, what I noticed in the book is, you speak almost with exasperation, if I can be profane, oh, for fuck's sake, here we go again. But you're not bitter. No. Did I miss something? Like, that's pretty amazing. I, I attribute that to my mom. Um, my mom was never bitter. My mom always bounced back. My mom never minimized the pain or suffering that we were experiencing, but she didn't believe in letting that define her. She didn't believe in letting her, herself be defined by that experience. I remember there's a, there's, a, there's a trait that I learned from my mom, which I still use till this day, and that is people would, you know, when we'd be driving or walking in the streets, someone would shout a racial, racial slur at my mom, you know, in the traffic. Some random person would just shout something out, and my mom would smile, and she would say it back to them, you know? And it's, it's, it was the craziest thing I'd ever seen, because as a kid, I didn't understand what was going on. I was like, did you not hear what they said? <laughs> Would you, and, and then my mom said to me, no, she said, no, how can they spoil my day? Because they said something, now I, I must feel a certain way, no. She said, you, don't, you have no power over me. I said, no, she said, I will fight you, and I acknowledge that you are oppressing me, but I'm not gonna let you spoil my day. <laughs> she goes, I'm having a wonderful day, I'm walking, the sun is shining, and now because you say something, I must feel, so she would throw it right back in their face and with a smile, someone would shout something and be like, go, you know, you bloody monkey. And she'd be like, oh, God bless you. God bless you. And she'd be like, yes, oh, my monkey brother, God bless you. And you could see people didn't know what to do because the, the whole point of, of hatred is to inflict pain. If the person interprets it as love and sends it back to you, what do you now do? And that was how my mom approached life. She went, the bitterness that you hold you are the only one who holds it. You experience it. So if you are bitter at this place that is oppressing you, at the system that is oppressing you, what's happening with that bitterness? It's not helping. It's not doing anything. You are the one who sits with it in your life, in your heart, in your home. So my mom was like, no, we're gonna be happy and we're going to be, you know, we're gonna be smiling. And then when we go out there, we fight. And then when we come home, we, we we live our lives, and that was my thing. I think one of the biggest gifts my mom gave me was also, she never made me feel sorry for myself, hmm. you know? I didn't think we were poor, I just thought we were black, which oftentimes means the same thing, but it didn't make me feel that I was in a situation. I felt like this was just a life. Everyone around me was living the same life, you know? Everyone around me was poor. Everyone around me was eating what they could when they could. Everybody around me was going through the same things in different ways. So there was no point where I felt like I was having a woe is me experience. I was just going, this is life, it's not great. There are points in the book when I think, I know where Trevor Noah ends up. This is, as I read the story, and this story and this story, this is improbable when he's burning down the house, when he's running from the guards who when don't the catch him. When the house burned down, I did not burn, I didn't burn the house. When the house, house, the house burned down. When the house burned down, <laughs> please. the cinders, yes. when he escapes from the guards who are chasing him for shoplifting. And then there was a moment when you come out of school and you begin to make CDs. And this yes. is your thing, you guys have a scheme going. And you were in 
one of these homelands, and that's what you're doing. And I'm like, how in the freaking world does he go from selling these CDs and DJing parties to where he is now? And yet, this is the beauty of your life, the improbable, life is beautiful. <laughs> you make it all connect. How does that happen, Trevor? I feel like you are just constantly moving forward. You know, I, I've always loved the analogy, you know, the, 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 the phrase, um, live life like water. I always love that because I, I think that's how my mother lived. That's how she taught us to live. Water is constantly flowing. It takes the path of least resistance, but it is one of the most powerful forces. You know, when you look at water on a day, it'll seem like a rock is blocking its path, but the water is slowly eroding that rock, and it won't happen overnight, but in time, the water will still be there and the rock will be long gone, you know? And it's almost like the water realizes that it's futile to try and slam up against that rock. It'll just keep going around it, you know, it'll, it'll adhere to the, the, the blockade that the rock has imposed, but just through its action and its will, it will slowly make that path better and better for itself. And that's basically what my life has been. That's what my mom taught me, that's what she did. I didn't even realize that she imbued that uh, in me. And you know, I was imbued with my mom's progressive mindset. She just made herself better, she read more books, She learned to type, she studied real estate, she learned accounting, she, she just wanted to be better, and better in a world where there was no future, don't forget that. You know, this is growing up in a country where as a black person you have con you've been condemned to menial labor. I grew up in a country where a black person wasn't allowed to have a job in an office, a black person wasn't allowed to be doing anything above cleaning or picking or growing that was your position, that was your life. And this is not hundreds of years ago, this is in my lifetime, you know? So, but my mom, she, she refused that. She was like, I'm going to learn how to read, I'm going to learn how to write for myself. I don't care if I use it or not. And she was always just trying to move one step to the next, one step to the next. And then I did that in my life as well. And so I never set out to be here, but I, you know, I just went from one, one thing that moved me on to the next thing and I was, selling CDs on one day and then I'm DJing another day and then DJing takes me into a career in, in radio and then radio and then there's comedy and then and everything comes together in the end. Uh, but it's just that tiny little step that takes you forward. The book is, a theme is the role of humor and getting through life, but you don't necessarily talk about comedy, like you don't explain how you got into it or the routines or what got you to this moment. Did you decide to do that on purpose or it's just how the book turned out? I, I decided to do that on, pur on purpose because I, I ran out of space. Um, <laughs> no, what, what happened was these were the stories that I wanted to share. This is not a, a book about fame. I wasn't trying to write a book about that. I'm not trying to write a book about celebrity. This isn't a book about, it was never meant to be a, you know, a, a tell all or it's, it's nothing associated with fame or celebrity at all. It was sharing stories from a South African childhood. It was sharing stories that I feel even though they're so specific and in, in, in a world that seems so extreme, I found stories that connected with people on another continent. You know, I met people in America who I'll just be having a random discussion with and they go, I had the exact same experience. I had the exact same domestic abuse in my family. I had the exact same experience where I'm the first black person in my family to study or to travel or to do something with my life. You know, I am the first, my mother was the first to do this. Uh, my parents couldn't be together because of the fact that they were stigmatized. And even if it wasn't for race, it could be a, you know, a multitude of factors. But I came to realize that in the specificity of telling these stories, there was a broader narrative. There, was, there, there were broader themes. Um, so I, I only needed to tell those tales. And I think essentially what happened was I realized that although this book bears my name, this is really a book about my mom. You know, this is, uh, I was afforded an opportunity to write a book and without realizing it, it wasn't a book about me, but it turned into a love letter to my mom. You know, chronicling our life, but she was the hero of it. You know, I was just a sidekick. And all of these stories are the ones that really encompass that journey together because 
once I went out into the world, then I was living life predominantly on my own. A huge thing for your mother is religion. And you talk about the fights as a kid, not <laughs> wanting to go to church. She yes. wants to go to church. And in the end, when she's shot, it's almost a miracle how she survives. Yes. And one thing you don't get into towards the end is, I mean, it's pretty clear how she's going to look at religion. I want you to tell us about the role of religion in growing up and how you look at religion now, that that event with your mother, because up to that point in the book, you're kind of done with it. You're glad not to have to go to church. Does that change how you look at religion? Well, my thing is, we, we grew up in a super religious household. And uh, as I say in the book, most black people are extremely religious, you know? Um, and religion was forced on many black people around the world. And, you know, the, uh, the phrase I have in the, in the book, I'll probably paraphrase it, but it was, you know, the, the colonizers landed on African shores and they said to the natives, they said, you people need Jesus. And the people said, why? <laughs> and the people were like, because you need to be saved. And it was like, saved from who? And it turned out from them. <laughs> but, but religion plays a big role, you know, in, 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 in uh, African culture. Uh, oftentimes uh, surpassing or, or rather replacing, or, you know, traditional religions uh, that many people had. And in my family, we were, we were, I mean, my mom was into it. We were at three churches every single Sunday. And, you know, because she wanted a little bit from every single church. She wanted, you know, the, the analytical vibe of a white church. She loved how like a white pastor would break the Bible down and look at each verse from three or four different angles and try and interpret what was being said. And, you know, and then she'd want us to go all the way to a black church because she loved the feeling of the spirits. She said, and you know, and black church was hours long, hours. If you've ever been to black church, you're probably still there now. <laughs> like, black church just never ends. And I always said, I, I used to think when I was sitting there as a kid, I was like, I think it's because black people just have more to pray for, you know? <laughs> White people just go in to check up and be like, we're still good, we're still good, and they leave. <laughs> Black people are like, oh, we need time. We need, we need time. Um, but religion, religion was, was, was something that I think was necessary in my life and our lives at that time because the one thing religion gave us was a hope. You know, it was a hope that there was something greater to aspire to. It was a hope that something was watching over us. It was, it was what gave my mom you know, the, 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 the courage behind her decisions. My mom was, was, was so brave in many of the decisions she made, and I think it was because she had that belief that God was always with her. Um, so I, I fundamentally had no problem with religion growing up. I didn't like the people of religion. That was my issue. So I used to argue with my mom. She'd say, let's go to church. Church was an hour away. We had a horrible car. It would be cold. The car would be broken down. Whatever would happen. And I would say to her, why do we need to go to church? The Bible says if three or more are gathered in my name, <laughs> then I'm in their presence. There's two of us, we find one more person, <laughs> and God is gonna come join us here. That sounds like a pretty sweet deal to me. And so I was constantly working within the rules. That's, that's what my mom taught me to do. You know, she had done the same thing to apartheid, and I was just applying that to religion. I was going, these are the rules, so I will play within them. I will apply them as you have taught me. Uh, you know, and, and I loved religion as a kid. It, again, it was my, it was my, you know, they were my fantasy stories. Like, I didn't have superheroes growing up. I loved Samson. You know, I was reading stories about, about Joseph and his coat. I was, I, was, I was fantasizing about, you know, parting a Red Sea like Moses. That, that was my, those were my stories. I was throwing sticks on the ground, trying to turn them into snakes. I was like, this is my world. Um, but as I grew up, and, and I guess to this day, uh, to answer your question, uh, I, I've been c consistently frustrated by the gap between religion and the people who worship. You know, I go, religion, on its own, it, almost if it's like, if it's not touched by people, is a beautiful idea, you know, great stories, gives you something to aspire to, and many times it's a manual for life. There are wonderful stories you can learn from the Bible. Relationships, you know, friendships, uh, hardship, ideas, um, perseverance. There's so many great themes. But I hate the way people use it to control other people. And that's what, that's what always drives me away from religion. But then after my mom was shot, 
you know, to have a bullet strike your mother in the back of her head, pass through her head, not affect her brain, not affect, not disfigure her completely. I mean, she lost, literally lost a piece of her, n her nostril, which was miraculous. To be in that situation and then to walk around with 100% conviction that there is no God, it's just like, you know, <laughs> one of those things where I fought with my mom and she's like, well, you tell me. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. I have a couple more for Trevor and then it'll be time to get to your questions, so start thinking. Um, in between the stories, you will have like a page or so of thoughts on different things. And one of those really stayed with me. I could imagine you up in the middle of the night in a dark apartment and this really was something you wanted to get on the page. And this is what you wrote, just a couple sentences. We spend so much time being afraid of failure, afraid of rejection, but regret is the thing we should fear the most. You will never, never know and it'll haunt you for the rest of your days. Yes. What did that come, like something was going on when you put that on the page. No, it's, it's been the theme of my life. And when I put it on the page, it came because that comes from the story of Zahira. That is my one regret in life. The girl that I didn't tell I liked when I was in grade eight or nine, well, I was in grade nine, <laughs> and I didn't tell her. And it sounds like a stupid thing, but there was this girl in my school and she was just the most beautiful, woman, beautiful person I'd met. I wasn't popular, I had acne, I was this little awkward kid that people teased and I had comedy to defend myself, but I wasn't, I was just surviving, you know. High school is one of those places where you're just trying to get to the end for some people and that was me. And yet, Zahira was this oasis where she, I mean, she was, every guy was after her and yet yeah, she was just giving me time as a human being. And I was, I was madly in love with her, like as a person. And I never, I never told her because I'd been taught, you know, by my school that that was not my place. You know, it's, it's the reason I still hate fairy tales till this day. I hate every single fairy tale. Because what do fairy tales tell you? They tell you that only the prince is supposed to get the princess. You know, there's seven dwarves, not one of them kissed her, <laughs> not even one. You're telling me none of them were meant to be with her and you gotta wait for the rich guy to come with his horse and he gets her and it's, it's a reinforced story over and over again. Your job is that you, as the awkward boy next door, you're gonna be her friend and it's, you know? And I, I used to, I, I just never said anything because I was afraid of being rejected and she left the school abruptly during one of our summer holidays and I found out when we got back to school she had left and she hadn't just left, she had, she had emigrated to America. I was, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what do you mean? She's emigrated and she was gone. And then her friend who was, the reason I met her here, there was a girl named Johanna who I was best friends with my whole life. And we had just been at the same schools all the time and she was always popular. And she said to me, oh yeah, I'm so sad she's gone. Are you sad? And I said, I'm very sad. And she said, oh yeah, and it sucked because she really liked you. <laughs> and I said, what, like, what, what, are you, like, what do you mean? <laughs> And she said, yeah, she had the biggest crush on you and she always used to talk about Wait, it. Ask her out. And I mean, you can imagine, at that age when nobody of your peers has ever expressed any type of affection, uh, there was only one woman who loved me and that was my mom, <laughs> you know? And here I was hearing this, but she was gone. Mm -hmm. And till this day, till this day that sticks with me, you know, I'm, I don't regret anything in my life, bad decisions, things I shouldn't have done, everything I go has gotten me to this point, including that moment, I guess, but the regret of not knowing, you know, fail if you're gonna fail, succeed if you're gonna succeed, but don't regret, uh -huh. because if you don't do it and you never know, you don't have an answer. You will always sit with that idea of what if, oh, and that for me is, uh, that's something I've promised myself I'll never allow to happen ever again. And finally, of course, we're all still trying to cross-hatch, collate, figure out the election. I'm sure you've spent the last week thinking about it. Where are you with it right now? What do you think just happened and what do you think about how people should look at it? I'm in a good place right now. I, and this is just, just me as a human being, you know, I, I fight, <laughs> I, um, I, I used to fight about this with my friends a lot, but I, I, I recover very quickly and I heal very quickly. I, I haven't had, I always say to people, I haven't lived a life where I have the time, the luxury of, of time to be in pain for a long time. You know, in the first story in the book, I tell the story of how 
I was thrown out of a moving car and my mom jumped with me and I didn't have the time to stand and be like, I'm in pain, you've got to keep moving. And, and so luckily I recovered quickly and I was thrown by the Donald Trump election, um, not just because of Donald Trump and America, but because of where it feels like the world is shifting toward. You know, and if you look at this just through the prism of America, you can, you can get a very limiting view of what this means. But when you look at it, when you look at the world, it becomes a lot more frightening. You realize that there is a shift that is taking place all through Europe and Australia and now in America, a shift where right-wing populism is coming up. And, and it, it, was, it was a tough moment for me because I was like, you know, I always say this to people, I go, when you read through history, do you, do you ever think to yourself that you are the person that's going to be in that moment in history? No one thinks that, I think. Mm. You know, no one thought to themselves that they were going to be in World War II. No one thought to themselves they were going to be in World War I. It, it, it seems like a ludicrous idea. We read stories now, and I often hear people going, that can't happen to us. You know, they, don't worry, Donald Trump, you're insulated. It can't happen to us. We've got, we've got systems. They will look where those systems have gotten you. You know, the, the man has continuously shown you that the buttress that people believed existed did not. You know, Donald Trump, I say, will be the greatest stress test to American democracy because he's going to expose everything that is wrong with it. A lot of the ideas that America has are implied. You know, these are implied agreements that people have. The president is supposed to release his tax returns. That's not a law. You know, the president is supposed to divest his interests. That's not a law. The president has to have a blind trust of, that's not a law. None of these things are law. Has to live in the White House. Again, not a law. It says must be willing to relocate. Does not say has to relocate. <laughs> not a law. All of these things, children involved in the run, not a law. These are all things where you've just taken them for granted. I guess we all have. And now you're in that space. And I, I think... The one thing I, I say is this, I go, it's tough. I know it's tough because I struggle with it as well. People say to me, like with Thanksgiving coming up, I had so many friends say, I don't wanna go home. My brother voted for Trump. My uncle voted for Trump. My mom voted for Trump. And these are people who go, my, I could have sworn my dad wasn't that, I could have sworn my, you know, I'm a black man, how did my brother vote for Trump? I'm, I'm, I'm a gay man, how did my mom vote for Trump? I, so many people and the thing I, tr I try to say to them is, try and approach them as a human being and not a political opponent. Try and approach them as if you truly believe that they think they were doing right according to their point of view. Because oftentimes people are. And when you realize, when you look at it, when you look at it through a wider lens, you realize that Donald Trump was just the perfect person to capitalize on where the world is right now and where America is right now. But those people are not all voting on one thing. They are not a monolith. They're not all voting on one idea. There are all these small people who I feel were able to project whatever they wanted onto Trump. And everyone said, you know, the newspapers were very smart that said, hey, this guy doesn't say anything. And I said, yes, but to those people, he's saying a lot. Because when you say nothing, the person can project anything onto you. And that's what they did when he said, folks, we're not winning anymore. And then if you were a black person, you could look at him and go like, he's right, we're not winning anymore. And if you were an immigrant, you'd say, you're right, you're not, we're not winning anymore. And white people would say, we're not winning anymore. Everyone was like, this guy's right, we're not winning. No one asked him what that means, no one asked him where that goes, but people latched onto that because that's where the world is moving. Many factors, there's ISIS, there's taxes, uh, there's premiums going up with Obamacare. There is, there are so many ideas. And then of course you have those extra layers, the icing, I always call them, the, the icing on the cake, the racism and the misogyny. We don't ever forget those things. But the people are still people. People can change, people can grow. And one thing I learned growing up in South Africa is empathy. It's always easy to think that empathy is top down. It's always easy to think that empathy should be expressed by those in power. But the hardest place to express empathy is when you are the person who is being oppressed. And yet I feel that oftentimes that is the time when it's needed the most. Nelson Mandela was a great example of that. While he was in prison, he spent most of his time trying to teach his God, 
trying to teach his prison warden why he himself was a prisoner. He saw that man as being in a worse situation than him. Because I always say to people in America, I go, think of it this way, even as a black person, I go, as a black person, you're just being oppressed. You're being oppressed by laws. But once those things open up, you are free because you already were. Imagine someone who is trapped in their mind. That is something that people need to empathize with. And, and I, I hope we can moving forward. And if we can, then you know, we'll, we'll be in a better place. Uh, these are some of the questions that have come from the crowd, Trevor. All right, I'll try to fly through them. <laughs> okay, this is a sweet one from a fifth grader. What advice do you have for a biracial boy living with a single black mom? His name is Caleb. And P.S., what is your favorite wild animal? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. What advice do I have? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the best advice I have for you is try to listen to your mom. Uh, I know she seems crazy. <laughs> I know everything she says is wrong to you right now, but she is much smarter than you think she is. You probably won't appreciate it now, but uh, learn to appreciate her while she's still around. She loves you. Um, you know, she's with you for a reason. And uh, remember that one of the most important things is you guys are a team, you know? You guys are a team. You're on this journey together. Uh, you, you're in a unique position together. And I will say this for you, you're in one of the most exciting places in the world because not many people have the superpower of living in multiple worlds, and that's what you have. You know, you can be as black as you wanna be, you can be as white as you wanna be, and in the end, I feel like that's what everyone should be trying to do. So enjoy <laughs> it, Caleb. Sometimes it seems like a curse, but it's your blessing. Your and wild my, animal? And my favorite wild animal would probably be the giraffe. Yes. It's just unnecessary. <laughs> wow, there's a giraffe fan here? I would here? have never guessed. Wow. <laughs> Who saw that coming? There may be few, but they are committed. <laughs> if reincarnation is real, what do you hope Donald Trump comes back as? If reincarnation is real, what do I hope Donald Trump comes back as? I would hope that Donald Trump comes back as a Muslim woman who is an immigrant who has entered a beauty pageant at one of his competitions. <laughs> I don't think he's got the stuff to take it. We'll see. <laughs> what is the best advice you ever received? The best advice I ever received was everything is helping you. It is one of the diff most difficult concepts to understand. And it's not the same as everything happens for a reason. It's a difference. There's a difference. But it's everything is helping you. And it doesn't mean everything is helping you in a good way. Everything is helping you get to where you are trying to go. Now, sometimes you are trying to take yourself to a bad place. Sometimes you are trying to self-sabotage. So when I say that, you know, people go, well, but what happened? What about this time with this relationship? No, no, no. Everything could be helping to take you down a spiral that will end in your demise. <laughs> but remember that everything is helping you. You get fired, you get hired, you win, you lose, whatever it is. Everything is helping you to get where you need to go. But you have to really believe and want to go to that place. You're going to love this one. Do you feel like you're living up to Jon Stewart's legacy? <laughs> oh, you know, one, one of the greatest gifts Jon Stewart gave me, other than The Daily Show, was, um, was just complete humility and honesty, you know? I'm really lucky that I got to know Jon Stewart before any of the madness happened. Jon Stewart and I, our relationship started a year or two before anyone even knew me, you know? And that's, that's like, we have a private uh, relationship that nobody really knew about. And that was this guy saw me in the world, touring, doing stand-up, he saw me on the internet and he said, he literally said, I didn't know that he said it, but he said to someone in the office, he said, that guy can have my desk when he's ready. And this didn't come to pass for years, and I don't know why he said that, but he set out to find me, and he said, I want you to come and join me here at the show, and he told me nothing, you know? He, he just said, come and hang out, and I wanna show you how everything works, and 
he did that and I enjoyed it. And we just, we just enjoy hanging out. And we see the world in, in, very, in a very similar way. It's just we have different experiences. And what's great is John and I always joke about how if we were doing math, we'd both get the same answers, but our formulas and equations would be very different. But we still get the same answer. And one of the things that he taught me was I have to do it the way I want to do it. And that was one of the biggest reasons that he wanted me to host because he knew I was the one person who wouldn't try to be like him because strangely enough, I was never enamored by him. And he liked that about me. He was like, you really don't know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, you're some guy. I get that you have a TV show and you're John Stewart. And he's like, he's like no, I, I love this about you because you, you don't worship me, so you're not gonna try and emulate me. He said, I want you to be Trevor and just do the show. And, and, and that was the gift he gave me. And he said, everyone thinks they know how it should be done. Make the show you feel needs to be made. And with him in my corner, I was like, everyone can tell me what they want to tell me, but you know, as long as I've got his blessing and uh, his support, I just make the show that I feel needs to be made. May there be a lot more John Stewart's and Trevor Definitely. Noah's in the world. So this one comes from, and I, I apologize if I say the name wrong, Marjorie Chodakoff, mother of Adam Chodakoff, senior oh, wow. producer of The Daily Show. Oh, this is hilarious. So, you know, <laughs> she wants to know, should the Electoral College be abolished? Oh, yes, it should definitely be abolished. <laughs> um, it should be abolished because, I mean, it's a vestige of a racist time, you know? And that's, again, where we go to in America is that there are so many problems America faces, and I go, and then on top of all of that, you have the veneer of racism, which just doesn't help. And as a South African, I understand this because we too are faced with the same problem. You know, all over the world, we see it with Brexit, we see it with what's happening in Greece and in Austria, there's a rise of right-wing populism, uh, you know, and, and it's so easy to have that, that rise up because it's a very, very simple fix-all solution that is promised. You come out as a politician, you say the problem is because of them, this is the we, we get rid of the them, the problem is gone. And because of that simple solution, people buy into it because they're desperate. Um, you know, and, and, and that's a scary thing. But now when you add race on top of that, it's so much harder to dismantle because now there is a face that is attached to it. Now there is an added layer. Now it's not just us and them, but it's, it's almost like the us's and them have been targeted because of, there's, a, there's a paint color now that's attached to it. Um, you know, so I think the Electoral College is one of those examples. It needs to be abolished. It needs, like I always say, America needs to update its software. That's all it is. <laughs> it's, America has amazing software, but just it was never updated. You know, a, a constitution is something that should be living and breathing, in my opinion. And I, I remember going to Washington, D.C., and one of the most beautiful quotes, I, I'll paraphrase and butcher it, forgive me, but I think it was at the Lincoln Memorial, and it says, you cannot expect a man to wear the same coat he wore as a child and still have it fit him the way it did when he was young. And that is what should be applied to laws. They should always be growing and changing with you. You know, how do you not have laws about technology when we, there's nothing in the, in the founding father's book about an iPhone, there's nothing. <laughs> they wrote nothing about this. They, they wrote every, Every, all men are created equal because that was a time when women weren't a thing. It needs to be updated. All people are created equal. Those are small things that we take for granted in wording. You know, you think about it. We live in a time when, just in my lifetime, I've seen a change from chairman to chairperson. Those are small things that we don't think, you don't even think of how the world is designed to oppress and it's just, we've lived in it as the norm. Fireman, policeman, you know, these are things that we've just accepted. You don't know, misogyny is, is the basic f lens that we see the world through, and it's at such a soft level that you don't even realize it's happening half of the time. And racism is also one of those. Electoral college needs to go, and uh, wherever Mrs. Chodikoff is, I don't know where she is. Oh, there you are. Can I just tell you, that woman over there, your son, her son is the engine of The Daily Show. I honestly, I was lucky enough to inherit your son from Jon Stewart and he stayed on board and he holds that show to such a high standard. He knows every fact. 
He researches every idea. He looks through. He holds us to a standard that I often, I often fight with him and I say, even the news isn't held to the standard. And he says, well, you watch the news and tell me what job they're doing. You know, so hey. I just want to say another mom, another mom, not all the news, not all the news, but to another mom, thank you. Thank you. You know, you know when I say news, you know cable news is what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, that's And different. you know that, you know um, that. You know, people, we've got protests in Philadelphia. It's not a question, but a lot of people have been wondering how to look at the ongoing protests. And I heard you say something, and I thought it was worth asking you about it again. How do you look at the protests going on right now? I think protest is a, is a beautiful form of expression, especially in a democracy. It is something that is needed. It is something that goes beyond just saying. You know, because what's powerful about protest is this. Those images, and that's what people like Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King understood, the power of imagery. That's what Selma was really about, because you realize that you can, you can fight all you want, but when people see your struggle, when, see, when people see your passion, it changes them. It leaves an indelible mark on your mind that you can't create from any other form of communication. That's what makes protest so powerful. You know, but I, I, I implore people all the time, I go, you've got to be careful and you've got to learn how to channel your rage. And because I, I come from a country where, I mean, one of the most painful uprisings in South Africa happened in, on June 16th, 1976, where the youth of South Africa rose up, the black youth, and they said they refused to be taught in a language that wasn't theirs, the language of the oppressor. They were forced to not learn in their language, which would obviously impede their learning. And they fought, and they, they marched peacefully. And still, the police turned guns on them and killed scores of these children and there's images of them running through the streets bleeding and carrying each other and you know we we are lucky that we don't experience that right now we saw fragments of that in ferguson and uh, you know in in other places where there were shootings and that, that were protested but with this i always tell the people i go even in your angriest moment you don't understand when you throw that bottle at a policeman or when you set that car alight you haven't burned a car, you have burned the purpose of your protest. And now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying violent protest isn't good. I'm saying there are times for it and there are times when it doesn't work. You know, when people are protesting a system and an idea, it seems like it's, a, it's making exceptions, but if black people are going, this system is against us, they can only protest and they have to shake the world that they're in. You need to burn something, you need to break something because then it is felt. But if you are protesting to show that Trump is not your president, which is a proud protest that is seen and felt all over the world, why give them the opportunity to shut you down because you threw a rock at a policeman? One rock and then thousands of people can no longer speak. You know, you, you're giving away your voice just for that moment where you express your anger. And the worst thing is you didn't even hit him, it bounced on the helmet and it's gone. <laughs> you know, but, but protest and protest, but just remember that focus and, and when I read about Selma, that was one of those moments where I realized the importance. Martin Luther King, he aimed and he said, we have a purpose, we have a goal. We don't fight back, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard, but we need to make, the reason he wanted that is because he knew what he was trying to achieve. And so when you protest, don't ever stop thinking of what you're trying to achieve. After the election, most of us are experiencing disbelief, sadness, and fear. Given your history, can you give us any reason for hope? There is always hope. Uh, as long as people are willing to work, there is always hope. As, willing, as long as people are willing to, um, to believe, there is always hope. South Africa had no hope, and yet we're a country where we went through a bloodless revolution, power changed hands through democracy, it was a peaceful transition, and we are functioning today. People point to our violence and our crime and uh, our economy, and I go, we are a functioning country that has been in a much better place than any other country in the world where power was forcefully removed from one group and moved to another. And I see hope every single day. You know, don't be fooled because sometimes the news only reports what they want to because it's, it's, it's what sells, sensationalism. But there is a lot of hope. And even in America, I feel that there is a lot of hope uh, because at the end of the day, the weakness of the populist is that he cannot deliver. The weakness of the populist is that most of it is a lie. 
And so with time, time is your friend, time is your ally. And the only thing I say to people is build now while you still remember. Don't wait. You know, I said to people, I was like, you can't start your revolution six months before an election. You start building that now. And while you remember now, if you are a liberal, or if you're a Democrat or a progressive, this is the time where you look at yourself, point your fingers this way, self introspection and go, what can I do better? What can we build now so that if and when the day comes that that person is no longer in power, are we in a stronger position? Are we in a better place to move it forward? South Africa is the best example. We elected our Donald Trump, right? He's currently serving his second term. He's almost done. We're counting down. He's had countless scandals. His story has many parallels to Donald Trump came in you know, with 700 charges of corruption. Donald Trump has 400 lawsuits against him. He came in with a case of rape hanging over his head. Donald Trump has the same. Uh, his children are in businesses that stand to benefit from their relation to the president. My president had the same thing. Um, but I will say this, the press has done an outstanding job. The courts did an outstanding job. And most importantly, the people did an outstanding job. They made their voices heard. Social media has changed everything. People marched, people protested, and the importance of the vote. The one thing I, I think of in America is I go, everyone talks about who voted for Donald, who voted for Hillary, why, why? And I go, let's talk to that 50% who didn't vote. What's happening there? <laughs> Half a country didn't speak. Yeah. And that is almost more frightening because if people don't think democracy serves a purpose, then you're in a very dangerous place. Trevor, love your show and I'm a grandmother. What has been most surprising about African American culture? What is the most surprising about African American culture is how similar it is to African culture. I mean, it sounds uh, you, you, the same, but it's, 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 it's beautiful. I've traveled halfway around the world and then I find that I'm home just with a different accent. One of the things I admire most and I love most about African American culture is its resilience, its beauty, its, its magic, its, um, its energy. You know, uh, African American culture, I always say that's, a, you know, it, it creates, it just creates, it creates music, it creates life, it creates style, it creates personality, it creates so much. And what I, what I find magical about it is it creates in the face of adversity, it creates against all odds. And that's probably one of the, the most exciting things for me is just seeing a group of people who against all odds have continued to persevere, have continued to press to, have continued to be proud you know, and if you look at it, you don't even you don't even notice the change that you are you are uh, you are affecting or you, you're creating in the world until you realize. I remember one day I was, I was at a I was at a hockey game. I got invited to a hockey game in New York, and only white people <laughs> across the board. And we're sitting there watching this hockey game, guys skating on the ice, and then during one of the timeouts, the music came over the PA system and it was hip hop. <laughs> and everyone in that arena was nodding their heads or smiling. Some people were mouthing and singing along. And I was like, you don't even realize that change because it's like the water that's been flowing. There was a time when hip hop, are you kidding me? In a white environment, that personification of black, blackness was seen as the enemy and yet now it has slowly seeped in white kids don't even see themselves in the same way that white kids saw themselves 40 years ago. Now it is starting to melt together and it does take time. It's like erosion. It does take time. But when you take a step back sometimes and you notice the difference, then you go, how can you not say that there's hope? You know, and so that's one of the most magical things for me is that from such a small group of people, African Americans, they have been able to inject so much that has become the status quo for American life. And that for me is, is truly magic. We have come to the end of our time with Trevor and I wanna do something that I've never done before which is to personally thank you. It's been a long week, a very long day. I wondered how I was gonna make it through this. I needed this. Thank this you so much. This was wonderful. Thank, thank you so you. much.
Thank you very much. Thank you.